So my name is Lloyd Hoshaw, and I'm a teacher at Millard West High School, which is just outside of Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm going to talk to you today about the rhetorical situation, big idea for AP Lang. More specifically, I'm going to talk about what my first unit, one of the activities in my first unit is, and how that matches up to the skills that are focused on, uh, specifically 1A and 3A. Uh, and my real intent here is to show you that you're already doing what those uh, skills articulated on page 19 in the CED are asking you to do. Sometimes we just need to think about the activities we already have and how they match up and fulfill that, that potential. So one of the things I share with my kids is I uh, share this quote from William James, a psychologist, um, and I really focus on this concept of my experience is what I agree to attend to. I tell them that that's how they need to read. That's what close reading is, is the agreement to attend to something, even if it was assigned, but it, it adds to their experience. When we talk about reading in the CED, if you're looking at the PDF, it's pages 92 and 93. Um, these are the hints or the requirements from the College Board. There are no texts that are specifically indicated in our course. Notice the level of sophistication for the writing. That they're reading challenging texts every day. It's reading that provokes responses from multiple perspectives. These are all things that we need to look for when we're talking about the texts in our course. Um, require teacher involvement or scaffolding. So it's not something that kids should be able to do on their own. They're actually going to need us as well. So. Real quick, the difference between a strategy and activity, and I'm going to share both with you today, is that me out of the way. Is that a strategy is a learning exercise that can be replicated and adapted. So I'm going to share with you actually two versions of one that I do. Maybe you've heard of Jigsaw or Parashare. Those are always strategies. It doesn't matter what the text is. It's something that you can replicate and kids can do. An activity, on the other hand, is confined to a particular learning situation. So I'm going to share both with you to set up this, the way I start doing units one and two. So here's a strategy um, that I think matches up well with close reading. I tell them that we're going to apply a lens to any text. So especially early in the course, I give them specific things to locate. So locate um, use of uh, powerful verbs, locate uh, biblical allusions, like I'll tell them at the beginning of the course. By the end, they should be able to make those choices on their own. Excavate or extend means to pull it out of the text and or to extend it and use it um, with a question, like what does it make them want to look up and think about? Nest together is getting them to realize that they can start to control how they put the information together, that it doesn't just have to be a summary, that they can start to pull things from multiple places. And then ultimately it puts forth some sort of claim or purpose that they are asserting. And I put that as it suggests that what is the author or writer trying to accomplish. So this is a text that I've used uh, often, pretty much every year that I've taught AP Lang. Um, and it actually comes from the 1984 exam. And it's a description of a boxing fight between Benny Prey, or Brett, and Emil Griffith. So what I have them do is I usually hand it out to day before, or I hand it out in a class. I have them read it and annotate. And I say, I give them two questions. So when first time you're reading through, it's just what do you notice? And that's the locate step. And then what questions does it create as a reader? And that's where they're starting to extend their understanding. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video uh, and read and annotate. And that short uh, bit.ly address should take you to this pass. Now that you've finished reading, the passage, you've got your own notes on it. You have those first two. What did you notice? What questions? Then I add to the experience and I say, okay, so what connections can you make? This can be to personal experience, to outside text, to other texts that I've been assigning in class. So I'm setting up the connections I want them to see. And then what realizations do you come to? That usually happens after we start discussing. Like what do they realize now that they didn't know before? Um, what do they learn from their peers? What do they notice that their peers pointed out that they didn't see on their own? So, uh, 
Sometimes they give them an organizer or a tool early in the course where they're pulling out words that matter, evidence and details and organization. As we move further into the class, I kind of pull that from them. And then again, I, I like to use quotes and pull out quotes from different texts that I think are useful. Sorry about that. Um, so this one's from Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. She talks about a one inch picture frame that she actually carries around with her. And I told them that's a great way to think about writing and reading. So you can only write as much as you can see through a one inch picture frame. That's how much you want to focus in. And then when a whole project is overwhelming, breaking it into little pieces. So as a reader, I tell them that's what they're doing. They're taking that one inch picture frame and applying it to the passage. And as a teacher, what I'm telling you is to do the same thing with this unit sequencing that's laid out. Um, whether you choose to follow the sequence or not is up to you. But I just wanted to show you how most of us are probably doing a lot of the things in unit one and unit two towards the beginning of our course anyway. Um, so as you look at these skills, think about the text you already use, and we're going to focus on 1A and 3A. Um, yeah, 1A, 1B, and 3A, and, and how that Perret passage really plays into those opportunities. So for years, I've done a Socratic discussion with um, this passage. And I had these questions. These are the questions the way I originally had them worded. What is your dominant impression of Pret? What is your dominant impression of Griffith? Uh, what can you infer about the speaker from the details that are sports specific, the frequency of detail? What does that tell you about his identity? Because in the passage, the writer is not identified. But what I want you to see is that these questions, what I want you to see is that these questions add a, match up to what's in that sequence. So my what's your dominant impression, that's really asking these key questions over here that are included in your CAD. What is the writer's purpose? What perspectives the subject might the audience have? Um, and then if you look at the second set of questions, can you infer who or what is the writer audience? What provoked or inspired the writer? What does this imply about the writer's identity? Um, these are all questions. So now I can start using these questions in the key questions area of the CED. Um, and that starts again on the PDF version on page 98 under the instructional approaches content tab. Um, and this is probably my favorite part. I love the key questions part in the CED. Um, it allows me to pull uh, this wording and then I can use it in multiple places. So again, how does this work? These are the questions I've always asked. And then I looked at it and I was like, well, I'm doing what those key questions ask for. Um, how does he use concrete details? Where do they establish a claim? How does the writer's commentary establish a logical relationship? Um, how does the author's use of numbers? What evidence, facts, anecdotes are used? And so I'm already realizing that the way I've been approaching the class matches. But now I have a new set of tools and language that can help them uh, with the whole course overall and even prepare for the exam. And then, of course, you, you may have encountered David Joel or have one of his textbooks uh, in your class. And this is his recent, relatively recent chart of the rhetorical situation, uh, all the way through down to these surface features that we look for. Um, and of course, this new word exigent showed up in the CED, and it caused a lot of us to kind of like pause. And really, it's just an issue, problem, or situation that causes or prompts someone to write or speak. For years, I've been using the word catalyst with my students instead of the word exigence. I'm now using both so that they'll recognize the word exigence on the exam. That's really what this is, is what is the catalyst to get them to write? Um, you know, Norman Mailer is the author of the passage that you just read. He's an author. He's going to write something. But what caused him to write this? What was the catalyst? What was the agent that provokes or speeds significant change? So I want you to pause again and Google search or Bing, whatever search engine you prefer, uh, these three names, Emil Griffith, Benny Perret, and Ruby Goldstein, and just kind of collect what you discover about these men and how that begins to inform the passage that you read. So go ahead and do that. Pause again.
Okay, so if you're like my students, I usually do this as a homework assignment. They come in the next day and they just start talking. There are so many things they learn that are outside of the passage. And I tell them that that all feeds into the exigence because Norman Mailer knows some of that. Some of it happens later, but just our understanding of the passage has changed. And I also want you to start considering these differences in text. So again, our CED tells us, you know, we need to use text, but images can be text. Um, I use book length works. I use podcasts. I use images. I use graphs and charts. All of these things become text in my class. I want them to treat everything as a text. And it really allows us to then kind of build a deeper understanding of any issue or idea. It really builds on that multiple perspectives idea. And in fact, something that I found really useful uh, last year, and I continue to, to lean on it for next year, is I went through all of those key questions in the CED, and I started pulling out the ones that I found most relevant or most fitting of my teaching style in each of the four big ideas. And I created a 20 question sheet. And I told them that, you know, a lot of kid, times kids struggle with annotation. These are generic questions that can apply to be any text. And it's not all gonna work depending on the text that they're reading, but if they're working with these questions, they're gonna dig deeper. You're gonna start to pull up those ideas of claims and evidence. You're gonna start asking questions about exigence and what motivates the writer. And that's really what unit one and unit two is about, is if they get to moving below the surface, and asking deeper questions, then they're gonna be prepared for the rest of the course in order to apply it to their writing. So I hope this was useful. I hope you think of your own text that you think is engaging uh, in your own classroom and good luck starting your year.